Hey, Hampton Roads Church, it's Matt and Katie Fisk, and we uh, are so excited to be able to be with you guys tonight uh, for this teaching, this meat eaters thing. And uh, we just want to let you guys know that we we miss you guys uh, so much. We we love the Hampton Roads Church. We're so grateful for uh, everything that that the Hampton Roads Church has has given to us and supported us uh, over over the years. So we miss you guys and we love you guys. So we're really excited to be able to get into the Old Testament context of the New Testament scriptures. It's been really fun for us because over the last year and a half, Katie and I have been. Uh, kind of on a journey of yep. digging into the Old Testament context of Scripture and letting it come alive in ways that we never we never expected to. But, uh, growing up for me, the Old Testament had a few fun stories, and I I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed uh, the Prince of Egypt, and I enjoyed the Judges and David and Goliath and and all that kind of stuff, um, but. As far as uh, letting it uh, breathe and what it meant for me, it, th that was harder to come by. I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I'm a New Testament guy. Why do I need to go back to the Old Testament? That would be like me going back to using, you know, Windows 95. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that. Or dial up. Or dial up. Why would I do that? I've got something so much better. And I can look at it that way, but... If we do that, we have to remember that the entirety of the New Testament, every single New Testament book was written by a Jewish person writing for the most part to Jewish audiences. And so to remove ourselves from the context of that, that the, 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 the Old Testament would have been something that every author and most of the audience would have been intimately familiar with is to remove ourselves from like the people that that mm -hmm. that wrote it, it's pretending like it, it happens in a vacuum, which it absolutely didn't. And the way I, I, I'd like to describe uh, the way that the Old Testament works in the New Testament is you, if you've seen some of the the newer Star Wars movies, like uh, say any of the more recent ones, like The Force Awakens, or or I'm so sorry if you had to watch Rise of Skywalker, it's just terrible. But if you if you watch The Force Awakens, it's a it's a movie that is pretty much a retelling, a reboot of the very first Star Wars movie way back in 1977. And it's full of Easter eggs and it's full of things that that you would only catch if you were intimately familiar with the Star Wars saga. If you're watching the movie itself and you've never seen a Star Wars movie, you can watch the movie in and of itself and you're fine. You don't need to know anything about Star Wars. You can still enjoy the movie. But if you know all the other six movies, or if you're watching the, the ninth one, all the other you know eight, nine movies, then you're going to get so much more enjoyment because there are things that are put in these movies that are references to older ones. There's lines and, and dialogue that's set in there that that only people that have are familiar with that are going to recognize. And you can you can watch it and it's okay. But if you know it, it's just that much more special. And maybe you're even getting uh, different, deeper meanings out of it that people that aren't familiar with those things would get. Mm -hmm. If you're with me so far, if you've never seen Star Wars, I'm so sorry that I just nerded out on you, but that's actually impressive that you've never seen a Star Wars movie. So <laughs> good for you. We're impressed. Um, sad, but impressed. <laughs> uh, and, and that's what the that's what the New Testament is like for the Old Testament. The New Testament is dripping, and I mean literally dripping, with Old Testament references and language, things that are probably even subconsciously done by the authors. Maybe they realize they're doing it, maybe they don't. I tend to think they do. Uh, that it is all over just about everything. Mm -hmm. And if we read the New Testament by itself, that is totally fine. You can read that and still get the lessons from it. You can still understand that Jesus is the Son of God. You can still uh, know uh, about the basic morality things of what it's like to be a disciple without any of the Jewish context, right. without anything in the Old Testament. But 
when you add that to it, when you add that context, what it does is it takes an old black and white movie that you love and it's fine, but it takes that and brings it to living color 4K HD Dolby digital surround sound. And you're like, I didn't even know all of this was here, yep. but it's here and it's rich and it's even more exciting to what you knew in the past. Anything you want to add on that? Yeah. Yeah, for me, I just had no idea how much the New Testament hints back to the Old Testament. And I always thought it was really cool when I would read the New Testament and I would see quotations of the Old Testament and scriptures reference. I was like, oh, wow, like there's so many different connections. But I was missing so much because there are a lot of quotations, but not nearly as many as there are hints back to the New Testament or the Old Testament. And it's really brought such a depth um, to my understanding of the scriptures and it, it shows that Jesus is just this genius. Like I already knew he was amazing and he was smart and he was clever. But when you start to realize the kinds of points he's making by hinting back to the Old Testament stories, you realize that he's creating these like masterpieces in just a few sentences or in one sentence or, or in a parable or in a story. Um, and so it's been really encouraging and exciting and it's definitely brought a new depth to my own Bible study. So let's get into a few things of, of how you can begin your own journey into looking at the New Testament through the uh, context of the Old Testament. And uh, the, the first thing that we want to bring to your attention is the way that uh, kind of the basics of Jewish hermeneutics. And there's kind of like four levels of Jewish hermeneutics. Uh, the first one, and the, the acronym is PARDES, P-A-R-D-E-S, but it's really P-R-D-S. So it's one of those acronyms. It's like a fakronym, but whatever. The like first- The kinds that Ed really likes. Yes, absolutely that. We miss that. Not a lot of acronyms. No, there are a ton of acronyms <laughs> up here. They're just government agencies. Um, so the first level, P, uh, it stands for Peshat. And what that means is that's kind of the 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 first, the prima facie, the on the surface level understanding of the text. It's kind of like when you read when you read a scripture, it's the Sunday school lesson that anybody could get out. And that that is fantastic. We need that. That's not any less uh, biblical. It's not any less godly. It's not any less powerful, but that is the, the top level. The second level, most of the time, for, if you're like me, I usually stopped there. It's look, you need to lay down your life for your friends. You need to be a good neighbor. You need to not lust. You need to um, give to the poor, which is fantastic. Like do that. But if you go to the second one, the R, so we have Peshat, then we have R, which is Remez. And Remez means hint. It's a reference back when a rabbi would teach. It's a reference back to something in the Tanakh into the scriptures and sometimes even to the other uh, traditions, but it's a it's it's kind of like a hey go back there go go look that go go check that out even more, and that's kind of the level that we're trying to get to a bit more that there are hints there are remezes all over things in the entire New Testament but particularly what Jesus does, Jesus does nothing on accident and. Most of his words are so loaded with meaning that if we take a, a second to look, we're going to get a deeper meaning. So that's right. the R. Then the D would be Darash. And Darash is when you take that remez, you follow that. It's like the rabbit hole. When you yeah. follow it, what's at the end of the rabbit hole? What do you find? What's at the end of the rainbow? And it's that it's that hidden truth. It's when you've wrestled with the remez, you see a deeper meaning that the remez unlocked from the Peshat, from the, the surface level, which is pretty cool. So it's, you follow the hint to down the rabbit hole and you find the treasure at the rabbit hole, which is what the rabbi was probably meaning in the first place, right. or this is the thing for you to wrestle with. And then the S is Sod, which is is like once, you, once you've wrestled with all these things, it's not something that you're gonna find by studying the word, it's going to be something that God himself has to show you. It's divine revelation. It's right. you in your quiet times and you journaling and you praying. And it's like, oh my gosh, now everything makes sense. It's your 
aha moment. And so these four things that we're going to be looking at, um, or these four levels, are going to help us uh, dig into the scriptures and in the New Testament. And we're going to kind of follow a little bit of that pattern. And what we like to do is, okay, all that you're like, I'm getting overwhelmed at this Hebrew stuff. Don't worry, it's going to be okay. What we're going to do is kind of help you through a basic workflow of this. And, and by the way, so Katie, Josh Lund, and myself started a podcast um, that we literally do this with, we're going through the book of Mark right now. So uh, check us out. It's uh, the Nova Academy podcast. You can see exactly what we're doing uh, with that if you'd like to learn more with that. But we're going to give you a quick run through here of a few examples. And and there, there are... We, as we are talking about looking through New Testament stuff, we found kind of five basic things that when we read the New Testament, when we read it, it signals to us that there's probably a hint, a remez, there's something, there, there's a rabbit hole that we need to go down. And so those five things that we, we'd like to go over those with you, those five things are when you're reading the New Testament, there is to pay attention to geography, to pay attention to similar plot points or similar stories that are being told, Old Testament, New Testament. Third one is numbers, numbers that pop up and numbers that are um, that play play roles in, in teachings and stories. Uh, and a fourth one is strange phrases. If there's a strange phrase, like what does that what does that mean? It, it probably is a signal back to to something in the in the Old Testament. And the last one is how to handle quotations of the Old Testament in the New Testament. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three examples. Uh, the first one's going to cover geography and similar story. The second one's going to cover numbers and strange phrases. And the last one's going to cover quotations. Yeah, I think what I would add just on those, those different things that we're going to be watching out for or looking for in the stories is that before when I would read the New Testament and I would see things like geography mentioned or numbers or whatever, I wouldn't think anything of it. And I would just think, sometimes I would think like, that's so random. Like, why is it like talking about this place, but it doesn't talk about places in other times? Or why does it say 4,000? Uh, why does it say 5,000 people? Why does it say this many loaves and this many pieces of bread? Like, I was like, it, those things just didn't make sense to me. Um, but now knowing that they are meant to have you look deeper, it's really cool how there's like these hidden treasures and these hidden treasure maps all over the New Testament. Yeah, absolutely. Y'all still with us? This is the part where you say, come on, Matt and Katie, but we can't hear you. <laughs> so I'm assuming that you are like so fired up about this. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so so let's uh, let's go in and see what our, our rabbi and Lord Jesus has to say. Let's go to something that's super uh, su super common or super familiar to us. Let's go to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Go ahead and flip over to Luke chapter 10. And you, you, you definitely know this. So I'm just going to give you a quick thing. And what I'd like you to do is start looking for things that you normally kind of just pass over and not pay any attention to. Let's take a look here in verse 25. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, Well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? 
He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. We know this, this story. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's, it still resonates throughout the centuries and it's so important. There's a few things in here that hearken back to the Old Testament that I literally never once connected. Uh, and the, the first thing is that I always skipped over the geography. Yep. Because even though Katie and I have been to Israel, um, I, I still don't just think of like geography being uh, like a, a really important thing. I think of concepts and stories. But when Jesus includes geography or when the scriptures include geography in, in anything, the context, the place that these stories and these teachings happen influence the meaning. It's kind of like telling a story about a sailor in Norfolk, Virginia versus telling a story about a sailor in uh, Topeka, Kansas. It's going to be very different hearing those things in, two, in those two places. By the way, we really miss Norfolk. I don't know if that's... <laughs> I don't know if that's coming through. But the first thing is you, what you see is Jesus tells the story of a guy going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And the second thing, this is the thing that normally sticks out to us, is that the the uh, the hero of this story, the example in the story, is a Samaritan. Right. Now, most of the time, we get to the point where we talk about the historical context of what the relationship was between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. Most of us know it was bad. It was real bad, bordering on bigotry and racism and probably, probably not even bordering, probably like- I was like, going to say, just outright. Yeah, <laughs> long jumping over that line uh, in, into past, in, into racism, which is not good. So there's the, if we're going back to this Pardes thing, the Peshat level is, well, show mercy. The question is not who, who is your neighbor. The question is, who will you be a neighbor to? Nothing wrong with that. But when you see the geography here. And when you start to see, okay, this is a story about people from a person from Samaria showing compassion to a Jewish person over and beyond what's going on. That's, we don't see this, but if you know your Old Testament, this is going to send off bells. This is going to be eh, 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 big neon lights over, uh, go back to this scripture. Think about this. It, it's like a, um, you know, uh, the Death Star being blown up in the seventh, the seventh Star Wars movie. Well, duh, that's a reference back to the first movie and, and the third movie. They don't really have a lot of plot points in Star Wars. But, <laughs> but anyway, this particular passage nestled in Second Chronicles in the Old Testament, we find a story that's very similar. Go over to Second Chronicles chapter 28. And some of you are like, I have never read this before in my life. And I'm going to say, well, until recently, me too. <laughs> like, it never and, stood, stood out to me, not once that I read that passage. Yeah, but let's check this out. All right. In Second Chronicles chapter 28, let's start here in verse 8. It says, The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. And they also took much spoil from them and brought the spoil to where? Samaria. And just a little bit of the, the context here. These are Israelites attacking the Judeans. So it's during the divided kingdom thing. So the Israelites were more in the north and the Judeans in the south, and they were not getting along, but they were both, they were brothers. They were in the same family here. So when it says the men of Israel came and took 200,000, it's the men of Israel came to Judah and took 200,000 of the relatives. And they brought it back to where? Samaria. But then a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out to meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord your God of your fathers was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand, but you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as your slaves. Have you not sins of your own against the Lord your God? Now hear me and send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Mm -hmm. Certain chiefs also of men of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Yohanan, Verecha, a lot of names and stuff like that. But the point is Ephraim, and that, that would have been like 
what would become the Samaritans, by the way. So these guys, they stood up against those who were coming from the war and said to them, you shall not bring the captives in here for you propose to bring guilt upon us uh, against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt for our guilt is already great and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And the men who had been mentioned by name rose. So the chiefs rose and took the captives with the spoil, and they clothed all the naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink, and anointed them, carrying all the feeble among them on what? Donkeys. They brought them to their kinsfolk, where? At Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then they returned to Samaria. Okay. So there are way too many things in this story and similarities between this and the Good Samaritan for it to be an accident. Right. What you see is you got people from Samaria that um, have have come upon people. And in this case, they've kidnapped. But what you see is a, a huge repentance, a shift in mindset. And they're like, hey, we are, we're not gonna do this. In fact, there are feeble, there are captives and whatever, but we're gonna show mercy, not just by sending them back. Because all they all they needed to do is say, hey, we're just gonna return these people. Mm-hmm. But instead, they act in this great moment of compassion. And what I love is that they gave them sandals, provided them with food, drinks, anointed them. And then here's here's the, the biggest connection. If you didn't get it, they brought the feeble on donkeys and brought them back. What does this good Samaritan do? Well, he takes the beat up guy and puts him on a donkey and he clothes him and he cares for him. And he says, look, I'm going to take care of you, whatever the cost, Mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy. And just to add another aspect of this. So we have a similar story and we have geography, Samaria. We have uh, this this act of mercy. And then the other part is that if you, if you don't remember, where was the uh, guy in, Sam- in the Good Samaritan parable? He was going from Jerusalem to where? Jericho. So all the signposts are up here. Jesus is saying, hey, there's a lesson to be learned from this Good Samaritan, but there's another lesson. I am hinting at this story right here. Yep. That's the remez. That's the hint. So if we go, that's the rabbit hole we go down. And when we wrestle with this, what do we find? Well, what I find here is not just an act of mercy, but how they got there, which is really interesting to me. What made the Samaritans change their minds and their hearts towards their enemies, the Judeans, and become super merciful? Well, it's this part in here where the prophet comes and says, look, have you not had any sins of your own against the Lord? You can't do this. So how do we get to the point where we can be compassionate and merciful towards our brothers that we feel like our enemies, people that don't deserve it, like the Judeans and the Samaritans were together? Well, it's by remembering that we have things against the Lord God ourselves. When we get in touch with that and what we owe God, well, how do we look at someone else and say, I refuse to be merciful to you when God is being merciful towards right. me. Paralleling Matthew 18, which is really cool, but that's a separate thing that's going on. But you have all of that and, and you get this second, this second deeper meaning when you just take a little bit of time and go into the Old Testament context. So how would you figure that out? Well, easy. Start noticing geography. When there's a place mentioned, do a little search. Do throw a name, a, a town name, a city name, a country name into your Bible search, whether that's Bible Gateway or or a software like Olive Tree or Lagos. Do it. Just see what happens. See what pops up. And this is the next thing is you got to start reading the Old Testament. You got to start reading it so that you know some of these stories. Because if you don't know the stories, there's going to be things that it's not going to show up in a search, but it'll show up when you start to read and be familiar with these stories. Mm-hmm. So. That's one really cool example, geography and similar retellings of stories. Now we're gonna move on to the second example, which would be uh, numbers and strange phrases. So with that, 
we're going to reference Matthew 18 and the parable of the unmerciful servant. So we're probably very familiar with this passage, so we won't read it. But the parable starts with Peter asking Jesus how many times he should forgive someone. Jesus answers with a story of a servant whose master forgives him for an outrageous debt. But then the servant turns around and chokes his fellow debtor. When the master finds out, he is outraged and throws the servant in prison. When Peter asks Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? There's context behind that question. The Jewish oral tradition was that you had to forgive three times. So it's possible that Peter is actually trying to be spiritual like his rabbi who always ups the ante on things. And, and maybe he's trying to up the ante here. The number um, seven in Jewish tradition symbolizes completeness or perfection. But Jesus replies, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. To say 77 is like an extreme of completeness. It's the number seven times the number 10, which is used as an amplifier, and then adding again the number seven. So if you didn't get that, it's basically just completeness times perfection times completeness a million times. <laughs> so basically Jesus is upping Peter's ante. So if you've read this story and what you've understood is that Jesus is calling us all to a higher level of forgiveness, you're absolutely right. That is the Peshat or the surface level meaning that we were talking about. And that's great. But there is another level going on here that we can explore. And that's the Ramez, which is the hint that points us back to the Old Testament. In his reply, Jesus is also referencing the story of Lamech in Genesis 4. And you can go ahead and turn there. The story of Cain and Abel sets up the story of Lamech, and you can read that on your own later. When God confronts Cain about murdering his brother Abel, he curses him to be a restless wanderer on the earth. In verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. Five generations later, Cain's great-great-great-grandson, Lamech, enters the scene. In verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. So it sounds very macho here. Super hardcore. <laughs> and what Lamech is saying is that if God granted Cain, my ancestor, complete vengeance, then I'm entitled to even better, complete, perfect, unquenchable vengeance. So Lamech's philosophy was, I'm going to out avenge evil. But Jesus tells Peter, you need to outforgive evil. This juxtaposition is perhaps the drosh or the hidden truth that you can only find if you know the remez. As I've wrestled with the passage, I believe that the sod or the, the revelation that God has revealed to me is that Jesus is even saying we need to forgive to be complete. We need to forgive to be made whole again. Jesus tells us that the solution is not vengeance, but to forgive from your heart or wholeheartedly or until you are wholehearted again with yourself and towards that person, which is super deep. <laughs> At the end of the parable, when the master imprisons the unmerciful servant, he gives him a sentence of until he should pay back all that he owed. The word That word for canceling the debt forgiving or paying back can also be translated as the word release. And so that it could be saying here, until you learn how to release others, you will not be released. So he is in a prison of his own making, but the master actually does give him a key to get out. When we don't forgive, we are in prisons of our own making. Unforgiveness tortures us. It's our own prison or torture chamber. 
even psychologically, it's like we torture ourselves every time we, we replay the scene, especially when we, we replay scenes of vengeance and avenging ourselves. But God has given us the key to get out. But this key forgiveness isn't logical. We can't logic ourselves into wholehearted forgiveness. And that's why Jesus' story is so challenging. True, complete forgiveness is soul reaching. And like the story that Matt just read about the Good Samaritan, we have to deal with our own problems, our own sin, and find compassion deep within our soul to forgive others. The TPT version describes a servant as stubbornly refusing to forgive, which is just like Lamech's stubborn declaration to avenge. Lamech's philosophy is cruel, it's oppressive, and it's malicious. When we adopt his philosophy of vengeance, we become all the things that we are accusing our perpetrators of being. We become cruel, we become oppressive, we become malicious. We don't stop the cycle of violence, but like Lamech, we add to it. So if you've read this parable before and what you've gotten from it is to forgive people, that's great. That is the core message. (laughs) But what we explored in the Old Testament through Lamech gives us even greater insight into our human hearts. Our tendency is to fight back and to believe that justice is brought about by vengeance. But Jesus is saying that justice is all about forgiveness. This drosh or hidden truth is what we would miss without the Old Testament context or the remez. Wow. I I, I know that when Katie brought that to my attention the first time, my jaw hit the floor and then went through (laughs) that floor into the basement and I think disturbed some mole people living beneath this earth's crust. (laughs) Pray for Katie. She has to live with this. I do. But, but I mean, like, do you see how cool that is? Like forgive people seven times seven. I was blown away by that just on that. But yeah. then when, when you get into like, oh my gosh, the rabbit hole of 77 and then get down to, oh my gosh, it's, it's forgiveness versus avenging. Like I, and, and then you get to the hidden meaning of like, oh my gosh, the way I usually try to work out my problems is to out fight people. Yep. I'm going to avenge myself 77 times. And Jesus is like, uh-uh, we're, it's 77 forgiveness, mm-hmm. which is like, Psh. so I, I hope you're catching what, what we're trying to help you, the, 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 the different kind of approach and, and workflow to this. It's not that everything we've done is wrong. It's that there's deeper levels to this. Mm-hmm. So now if you're sitting there going like, well, Matt, I, I don't have the Old Testament memorized. How on earth am I going to do that? Again, It's just starting to take notice of things like numbers are important to Jewish people. So if you take a number that you find, and I mean all the numbers in in the New Testament, particularly when Jesus does anything, and you throw it into a search, the numbers correlate to different things. And you can start to see the connections. For example, feeding the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fish. Well, if you start to think through what's a five and a two in the Old Testament, Let's see, five, oh yeah, five books of the Torah and uh, two tablets. And it's there's something about the Jewish law and of giving sustenance. And that's the thing there. By the way, even that story, homework, definitely homework, going to look at, see if there's anything in the Old Testament that parallels somebody miraculously feeding a large group of people from like nothing and then being satisfied. I, I'm not even going to give you the answer, but that's that's your sign. It happens. There's another instance of that. Go find it. It's so cool. So, um, but yeah, you don't have to know the whole Old Testament. You just put it in a search, and and these phrases like um, uh, the 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 seventy seven seventy seven times. If you start putting that in, start to just notice things that are like I'm not sure what that is, right. but that'll that'll help. Now here's here's the other part of this is. This it'd be so simple to we want to encourage you to invest in some kind of related verses resource. So uh, a, like a cross cross reference Bible that goes more than just what's in the margins of your Bible, because uh, for for example, the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge is is a, a resource that w- what it does is people have literally gone through the Bible and have identified scriptures that are related to like every verse in the Bible. And sometimes it's just like, this is kind of on the same topic, but sometimes it's exactly stuff like this. 
things that you never realized were connected and you end up finding some really cool things. So taking the time to, to, to invest in either a book version of that, or what I do is I have olive tree on my iPad and Logos on my, on my laptop. And I literally can just pull it up and, and, and see, okay, well, what are the verses that are related here? And I can hover over it and it pulls up the verse right away. So then I can look to see what is, what is there. And it just starts to pop up like, oh my gosh, this is more connected than I ever thought, mm -hmm. which is just so cool. Um, we're going to hit the last thing that we wanted. So, so far we've looked at geography, a similar story. We've looked at numbers and we've looked at uh, weird phrases, weird phrases. And the last one is I want to talk, uh, uh, we want to talk a little bit about what do you do with direct quotations? So a lot of times in the Bible, we, we have direct quotations uh, in, in particularly the epistles mm -hmm. where it literally says, as it is written, or as it is said in scripture. And if you're like me, I go, okay, I'll take your word for it. And maybe I'll hit the little like, you know, tap in or look up the <laughs> footnote and go, ah, yes, that is from the Old Testament. Good job, New International Version editors. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I just kind of trust that. But let's go over to Hebrews chapter 10. And I'll look at one example of what we can do um, with those quotations that maybe we're not doing. Um, okay, so Jesus taught like a rabbi. Paul was a taught like a rabbi because he learned from rabbis. <laughs> he learned from the rabbi who was the grandson of the rabbi that was the big rabbi Hillel. <laughs> Hillel. His, his teacher Gamal, uh, Gamliel was the grandson of Hillel who is one of the big two Puba uh, rabbis of the time and so they teach like this and one of the things that rabbis tended to do is they would refer to a scripture and it was another remez but what would happen is you you would hear the verse and the verse was true because scripture obviously but the deeper point or the drosh point, you wouldn't find that out until you went back and read the entire quotation. This particularly happens when someone refers to a psalm or a prophet. Um, the book of Hebrews is one of those masterpieces of you can't read like four words without running into some reference from the Old Testament. We don't have time to go through that. And there's a bunch of things like that. When you read Paul's letters, it's full of that. Um, you want a fun quiet time? Go and look at all the things in John chapter one, all the references there. They are chock full of Old Testament references. Um, but here we're going to look at a direct quotation in Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to start here in uh, verse 11. And this is talking through uh, Jesus' sacrifice and him being our high priest and how all that works, the new covenant. So let's start here in verse 11. And it says, um, every priest stands daily at his, at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. This isn't a direct quotation, but it's a direct allusion to Psalm 110, where it literally says that he sat down at the right hand, of the right hand of God until his enemies were made his footstool, which is interesting because the very next thing that happens, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until what his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet, which we don't even have time to go into all that right now, but go and check that out. That's a fun, quiet time too. verse 14 for by a single offering, he is perfected for all time. Those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Direct quotation. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Direct quotation. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Now, so we have those two direct quotations, which you'll notice because they're in quotes in your Bible, the editors have done us a favor. We're at a disadvantage because the Jewish people of the first century pretty much had large chunks of their entire Old Testament memorized. Like it, the same way that you recognize song lyrics, they've got this. If I say, we will, we will, 
Rock you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> like there's nothing else that that could be. You just finish it. You finish the phrase. And that's how they were with their old Testament that they could like finish. They could keep going if somebody referenced one part. Yeah. Now we can't do that, but praise God, we have the internet and things like that. So these are direct quotations to Jeremiah 31. Now we can take this and this is very clear. God's establishing a new covenant. He's going to put his law on our hearts and minds and I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. Very, very cool. Very yeah. awesome. It's like, it's like somebody, but if you're like me, I read this, like somebody was writing a research paper and citing their sources. Yes. And, exactly. and so you're like, okay, well, I'm not going to go back and read that. I'll just take your word for yeah. it. But the way that, that the rabbis would teach and the way that we're going to take this context is that they assumed that you were going to take that quotation and go back to where it was and think about what was going on before and after that phrase. So let's do that. Let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 31. Come on, Matt. This is great stuff. Come on, babe. You better be saying. Let's go, Bubby. I, ho I hope we're. I hope this is this is something for you. We love this stuff. It's so cool for us. Okay, so let's pick up um, exactly where in Jeremiah chapter thirty-one, starting in verse thirty-five. And so, um, well, let's, let's skip back a little bit more. So this is this is the way it works. Verse thirty-four. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me, which is the Holy Spirit testifying, by the way, which is the reference back to Hebrews 10. And they all shall know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will give their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The first thing there is that the part that got left out between the, the first part, this is the covenant I will make with them back in Hebrews 10. And then it skips down to, I will remember their sins no more. The missing part is this part in the middle. No longer will each one teach their neighbor <laughs> or know the Lord. They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. It's the missing part that actually points to the really cool thing, which is the new covenant. I will remember your sins no more. That's going to be with the Holy Spirit put inside of you. And from the least to the greatest will know me, which is like, what? That's the crazy part. But if we keep going, the context after this, I love this. Okay, so stick with me. This is some like prophecy stuff. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation. Then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all of the offspring of Israel for, for all they have done, declares the Lord. Okay, so that's like some pretty deep prophecy kind of stuff. Here's what, if you keep going those direct things, I will remember your sin no more is the quotation before. It's what gets referenced in Hebrews. But the passage goes on and to, to simplify this, it's that, look, I am God. I made the sun and the moon and the stars. And I say when day is and night is, and you know, it's 24 hours. This is how it works. And I have decided this is how it's going to be. But he says, I would rather depart from that. I will disrupt the order of the sun, the moon, the stars before I disrupt my covenant with you. Wow. Like, do you, do you understand that? Like, God's like, I will break the laws of nature. I would, I would disrupt gravity, but I will never disrupt you. I, I would, I'm more likely to ignore the sun. I would more likely forget to turn on the sun than I am to forget and forsake you. Mm -hmm. What? It's amazing. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that fills me with so much more confidence and excitement. And it goes on. If the heavens can be measured, the foundations of the earth can be explored, then I will cast off Israel. He's saying, yeah, if somebody, one of you guys gets up there with a ruler and can tell me how long heaven is, then I will stop loving Israel. <laughs> like that. And of course it's an impossible thing. And that's what God is trying to convey to, to every single one of us is that like, look, 
in this covenant. I, I will never forsake you. And in fact, the Old Testament is talking about his people. And the Israelites took that as meaning only them. But in the new covenant, it's all of us. It's all Christians, all disciples have been brought to a place where God's like, I'm going to forget about the son before I forget about you. And then when you go back to, to Hebrews, what's incredible about that is the very next phrase is incredible in chapter 10, right after it says that, it says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places of, of uh, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, another Old Testament reference. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, another Old Testament reference, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean, another Old Testament reference to Ezekiel, and in evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us approach with confidence because God's going to forget about the son before he forgets about you. Yeah. And so all this stuff becomes much deeper and much richer when you take the time to go, okay, I've got the, this top level, the Peshat, the Sunday school level, but I see these are like little hints all over. And if you take the time to go down those hint, those rabbit holes, you find something at the end after wrestling through it that's deeper than anything that you had before. Not more spiritual, but definitely deeper. And I think for a lot of disciples, me included, I've read my New Testament so many times that it kind of lulls me to sleep. Like I skip over things that I think I know and I understand. And you know what? I do understand them. But when I add this component, when I start to go down these rabbit holes, I start to see more about God's character and the heart behind a lot of these commandments, a lot of these examples, a lot of these things that were invisible to me before. Mm -hmm. But they pop right out, not by having a degree in Hebrew or in Greek or in theology. No, it's taking the, the five seconds to hop on a, a, a Bible gateway and do a search yeah. or to go and take a look at that reference, that related verse, or to just go back and read the quotation of like, I'm just going to read a little bit before and I'm going to read a little bit after and see what the context of this is. And then when we start to do that, we're going to see a richness and a depth to our faith and to to who God is in ways that we never have before. Mm -hmm. And it's going it, to, for us, it's really excited us and really brought us to a place where we are, that like new life has been brought into how we read the Bible and to our faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's amazing because Jesus is quoting Old Testament scripture all over the gospels. And I, I used to think that like, those quotations is what he was trying to communicate. And I, I thought it was just cool that he was quoting the Old Testament and making connections for people. But a lot of the times when he quotes the Old Testament, he's actually starting the conversation. And then in their heads, his audience is finishing the conversation. And so he may quote a certain verse from Hosea or something. But what he's actually trying to make them, the, his audience think of is the, the verses that come after that. And so he's making an even greater point or he, his point is even coming with more fire and brimstone or whatever it is. And so it's been really amazing going back and looking at the context and reading around those verses, around um, those hints, because back then, like Matt said, people would have it memorized in their head and would be playing the whole script out. And so they would get exactly what Jesus was leading them to. Yeah. So I hope this has been helpful. We want to just really quickly go over a couple, recap some practicals that we've talked about. And the first thing, if, if you want to start really digging into this, you got to start reading your Old Testament. If you're a, like me, who really just wants to stay in the New Testament all the time, then you, you got to change your, your approach to get this. Start reading the Old Testament. Start reading uh, the Torah. Start reading the prophets. Go and read the books that you don't want to read. Go and read the books that you usually skip over because they're too full of doom and gloom mm -hmm. and start to actually process those things. Uh, we, we talked, number two, about investing in a related scripture uh, resource of some kind, whether that's a, a chain reference, a cross reference, or uh, what what we use is the treasury of scripture knowledge. Uh, and that can be massively helpful. Number three, just take the time to start using 
uh, searches like Bible searches and Bible gateway searches and olive tree and whatever, it is worth uh, paying the little bit of money for the vast amount of insight that you end up getting uh, if you do that. But Bible gateway is free. So if you don't have the money, just pop on there and just take a little time to, to use the technology that we have at our disposal. And the last thing that I want to uh, encourage you is that this should not and cannot be done by yourself. Mm -hmm. We need to wrestle with scripture like this in community. You're going to miss stuff. You're going to forget stuff. You're going to overlook things. But if we discuss these things, we start to we start to have tension. We start to have maybe arguments. We, but we definitely start playing off each other and we start to remember and remind each other of what the scripture said. And together we get deeper insights into the entirety of scripture. Some of the, the coolest insights that we've, that we've had have been brought to us only through conversation yep. uh, with, with other people. Uh, particularly like our, our Josh Lund on this podcast, mm -hmm. we're literally discovering things. So as I, we're talking, through. yeah, and and but that doesn't have to be you know through a podcast form. It's it's just through conversation. Yeah, and and all of us together are going to see things that that one person could not uh, see as well uh, by themselves. And uh, oh, one one of the things we got so much of what we're talking, we got started down this path through uh, listening to the Bayma podcast. We can't recommend that enough. That so good. Yeah, there's so much that goes on. I think we like straight up stole some of the stuff that we talked about tonight from from that. But yes, uh, so we're accrediting it now, so we're totally off the hook for that. <laughs> um, but we 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 love Marty Solomon. Uh, we, we got a chance to meet him, talk to him. Uh, check that out. It's going to be so helpful uh, for you if you are interested in following down this path. But um, brothers and sisters, let. let let's just have a have that mindset of to be looking to the Old Testament to recognize that this is the Bible. All of it is a Jewish document written by Jewish people to a lot of times Jewish people. And that by taking that bit of time to see that context, we're going to see things in the scriptures and in God's character that we never saw before. So, yeah. yeah. Amen. So we love you guys. We miss you guys. We, uh, we hope you got a lot from this and uh, we will... See you later. Bye. Bye.